Hello everyone, my name is Miguel, and for the next 8 to 10 minutes or so, I will be presenting my paper on Amelia Lanier, Ben Johnson, and the true lineage of the English country house poem. Before I get into the actual paper though, I would just like to acknowledge that while some viewers right now may not be in the area, I am delivering this presentation on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. Despite our uh, strange new format for the colloquium this year, uh, we should still pay our respects to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. With that, um, Amelia Lanier and Ben Johnson may not be names as easily recognizable to some of us watching right now as maybe that of Emily Dickinson, William Shakespeare, or Geoffrey Chaucer, so I would just like to quickly introduce them. Both Lanier and Johnson are pioneers from the 17th century. Ben Johnson here is the first Englishman to edit and publish his own poetry and drama. Most sources about him will tell you too that his reputation as a poet and playwright is really only second to that of William Shakespeare himself. Amelia Lanier here is the first woman to publish her own poetry collection under her name. That collection, called Salvadeus Rex Judaiorum, is also pretty much the first of its kind. It's the first volume of poetry written not just by a woman, but also about and for women exclusively. It's also now widely acknowledged that she is responsible for the earliest example, as in the very first English country house poem. Just a little bit about the genre, um, its name kind of already hints at it, but I would just like to emphasize that it's always written in praise of a country house, which indirectly always ends up being a praise for the Lord, or in Amelia Lanier's case, the lady of the house. Consequently, too, they end up always praising the values held by those lords and ladies and just within those estates in general. Despite the acknowledgement, though, that Lanyard wrote the very first English country house poem with her The Description of Cookham, scholarship on the genre still tends to exclude her, and they also tend to credit the genre to Johnson and his poem to Penshurst. To just illustrate this quickly, we have this quote here from scholar Jim Casey. In their paper, where they compare a good number of country house poems, they also acknowledge that Lanyard's work does exist and that it did come first, but they also claim that she, quote, did not have the same influence on later poets, end quote. And that is why they exclude her from the discussion. In the same paper, Casey calls Johnson the patriarch of the country house poets. This is really representative of the attitude towards Lanyard in country house discourse. Because of her difference from this so-called patriarch and his descendants, the possibility of her having an impact or influence on the genre is almost completely dismissed. Which actually brings me to my thesis, which is emphasizing the precedence of Lanyard's The Description of Cookham in reference to Johnson's to Penshurst in a close comparative reading reveals her impact on the genre as a whole. There are multiple points of difference between these two poems to prove this. But for this presentation, I decided to focus on one in particular, which is the function of myths or mythical references in the English country house poem. As we'll see in a bit, Johnson and Lanier use myths in very different ways and for very different purposes, but it's actually this difference that puts them in dialogue with one another. See, Amelia Lanier's mythical references in Cookham serve to give a voice to women, especially those silenced by mostly male forces. You can see this right away with her first reference, which is to Philomela. For those unfamiliar with her myth, uh, Philomela first lost her voice when King Tereus, her sister's husband, cut off her tongue to silence her after he raped her. She also loses her human form when the gods turn her into a nightingale after Tereus tries to kill her and her sister for exacting revenge for that rape. In Lanyard's reference here, Philomela sings her sonji lays, or in other words, various songs that cook him. So not only does Lanyard give Philomela the voice she lost back because of a man's entitlement, she also gives Philomela back the choice about what to do with it. She now sings various songs instead of just the lament that the nightingale is known for. This continues too with her reference here to Daphne. Daphne in her myth also loses her voice in human form after Phoebus, or Apollo, 
starts assailing her because he has fallen just madly in love with her. Daphne prays to the gods to help her hide from her assailant, Phoebus, and, you know, they do. They turn her into a tree, because that's the best way to hide someone, apparently. Uh, in Cookham, though, uh, Lanyard reanimates Daphne once again when the trees of Cookham form like a comely veil to defend Margaret Clifford, the estate's temporary lady, and Amelia Lanyard herself from Phoebus when he would assail. Both myths, especially with the way Lanyard frames them in this poem, really draw attention to and decry the censorship and abuse of women at the hands of men. Lanyard uses these myths in her country house poem to put that subtext into the genre. The same thing could also be said about her reference here to unconstant fortune. Lanyard could just be talking about the actual mythical fortune here, who is known for her inconstancy, the whole concept of her wheel and all that, but she could also be talking about the actual inconstancy of fortune or property for women in the 17th century. At this time, they were meant to be property, not have property. Lanyard denounces this notion when she claims that this inconstancy of fortune is what cast them into so low a frame in the first place. We don't get this challenge to the status quo in Johnson's To Penshurst. In fact, he not only erases this function of myth in the country house poem, he actually domesticates it. The erasure of this challenge to the status quo really begins right with Johnson's first reference, which is to the gods Pan and Bacchus. Both Pan and Bacchus are associated mainly with agriculture, which makes sense since the opening parts of Penshurst do emphasize its naturality. However, they are also gods of revelry, ritual, and just high feasts. Having these guys foreground his poem and emphasizing their feasting and partying presents an image of happy mythical satisfaction within the estate. But with that satisfaction comes really the erasure of Lanyard's denouncement of patriarchal forces that suppress women in the 17th century. The domestication of myths in Penshurst first comes with Johnson's reference to the muses. Uh, in his poem, the muses, who are all also women, meet for Sydney's birth, um, Sydney being the his here and also being the lord of the house at the time of Johnson's writing. He can't even read, speak, or write yet, being a newborn and everything, but the muses are there, ready to serve him anyway. In Lanyard's poem, the power dynamic is much different. The muses have obviously greater power here as they give her their full consent, so she could have the power the virtuous to content. Consent also implies having to ask, which Johnson doesn't really do, as in Pensehurst, it is just expected that they would serve him. Finally, Johnson cements his domestication of myths in the country house poem with his last reference, which is to the Pinatis. The Pinatis are household deities whose main function really is to watch the house's provisions and also to make sure that the Lord's genealogical line survives. With this, Johnson effectively proclaims that myths that question the status quo, much like Lanyard's, have no place in Penshurst. Much like everything else in the estate, myths are just meant to serve the Lord and his men and make them happy. Continuing to claim that Johnson's poem is the model or prototype for the genre then, only perpetuates this domestication of myths and the resulting censorship of women's concerns. As we can see from Lanyard's earlier poem, this goes completely against the initial purpose of the genre's use of myths. Not only that, by removing Lanyard from the discussion too, we also remove this entire layer of nuance and conversation from the genre. To conclude then, what I have just established here is that the difference of Amelia Lanyard's poem from really all of its male author counterparts is not grounds for her exclusion in country house discourse. We can clearly see just from the difference between the functions of myth and the description of Cookham and to Penshurst that Lanyard's poem can be read in dialogue with Johnson's so-called model. If this is the case, then surely the description of Cookham can and frankly should be read a lot more alongside male-authored country house poems. If this is the case, then we really should recognize and respect that the English country house poem does not have a patriarch, but a matriarch in the name of Amelia Lanyard. Thanks so much for listening.